subject tonight is dealing with the fall of the nation of Israel. And why would we even discuss such a subject as that? What does the fall of the nation of Israel have to do with God's final warning to his people? Because if we fail to understand the progression of truth from Genesis to Revelation, then it is easy for Satan to use his ministers of unrighteousness to turn our minds away from the warnings and admonitions that have come to us at the end of the world. And because we place focus on an entity somewhat that is wholly um, um, uh, on the opposite side, um, we, we place Oh, well, they are the people of God. Therefore, those promise, those warnings and admonitions, they don't apply to us. They actually apply to them. And for this reason, many have turned away from the warnings that God is sending in these last days, just as the Jews in Christ's time and prior to turned away from the warnings and admonitions that God has sent. We look back in hindsight and we somewhat marvel at how the, the, the nation of Israel, how the Jews could turn their backs and, and kill the prophets, how they could reject that solemn truth that we say we believe here in 2017. We say we believe the writings of Isaiah and the writings of Jeremiah and Nehemiah. We say we believe Ezekiel and Daniel. We say we believe these prophets, Micah and Obadiah and Joel. We believe these prophets. And yet their message spoke is speaking more for this day in which we live than for the days in which they spoke those messages. But because, again, in a very crafty way, Satan has led the Christian body to somewhat disconnect themselves from the promises, the, from the warnings and admonitions, and they want to highlight the promises of prosperity. They want to highlight the promises of victory, and they will apply them to themselves. But when it comes to the warnings and admonitions, we say, well, that's for the nation of Israel. So tonight, we want to understand how this plays directly into where we are today. Now, we, 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 we've touched on this in previous studies. But when you look at God calling Abraham out of Ur of the Chaldees. You find God calling Abraham out. And God made promises to Abraham that he was going to bless him and his seed after him. There were promises that was made. He said he would give them land, the land in which Abraham walked upon. He would give it to his seed forever. We find that God promised them with eternal life. God uh, promised them with protection. All of these things God had promised. He told Abraham after Abraham had went and fought with the various kings of Canaan, God said, I am thy shield and thy reward. He told Abraham that I was going to protect thee. He told him he was going to bless him with a son. And again, there would be multitudes that would come out of his own bowels. And we see that this promise being fulfilled in the nation of Israel. When they came out of Egypt, they were numbered, uh, Moses says, their numbers had grown as the stars. And so we see that God was fulfilling his word, but there was something that the children of Israel had forgotten that those promises that God made to them were not arbitrary. They were conditional promises, promises that were built upon obedience. I want to give you a few texts. I want you to write it down. We don't have time to get into it tonight, but write down Leviticus 26, Deuteronomy 28. God gave blessings and curses, blessings if you obey and curses if you disobey. 
Well, what about when, when Balaam stood and sought to curse the people of God? And he said, how can I curse what God has blessed? They are blessed. I can't curse them. But the reality was, if you look further in Balaam's, in Balaam's, uh, 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 in Balaam's talk, Balaam said there was no iniquity in Israel. So while they were in harmony with God, God could turn curses into blessings. But when they turned their backs upon God, God had specified that as a result of rejecting his truth, there would be certain things that would happen to them, and not only to them, but all, all the way down to this generation. Now, brothers and sisters, I want us to see something. I want us to go in our Bibles to the book of Matthew. Let's go to the book of Matthew, chapter 3. Matthew, chapter 3. Because even in Christ's time, Christ had begun, through John the Baptist, began to show the nation of Israel that their standing with God was due to their walking in harmony with his promises. You find even today, the literal nation of Israel, or the ethnic Jew, if you will, you find that even in their in their Torah, even in their understanding of the prophets, they were interviewing one of the, the uh, scholars from the Jewish community. And the question was, well, as, I, as, as we look at all the various characters of the Old Testament, they say, they say how do you deal with Elijah? And Elijah proved to be somewhat um, of a character that, that did not fit in their, uh, in their narrative of how the prophets related to Israel. And so what they had to do, they had to somewhat re, uh, they had to somewhat give, give Elijah a new identity in their history. They had to somewhat rewrite his narrative and they had to paint it a little differently so that it would not feel that God really at any time was upset with the nation of Israel. But notice what the Bible says, beginning in Matthew chapter 3. Matthew chapter 3, here's John the Baptist coming on the scene and he's beginning the, his ministry and as he's preaching and he says in verse 7, verse 7 of Matthew chapter 3 and the Bible says, but when he, John the Baptist, saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees come to his baptism, he said unto them, O generation of vipers, who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bring forth therefore fruits, meat, bring therefore fruits, meat for repentance. And then he adds, and think not to say within yourselves, we have Abraham to our father. For I say unto you that God, that God is able of these stones to raise up children unto Abraham. Verse 10. And now also the ax is laid to the root of the trees. Therefore, every tree which bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down, cast into the fire. Now notice, John the Baptist is looking at the nation of Israel in all of their pomp and pride. And he looks at them and he says, say not to yourselves that you have Abraham to your father. In other words, your standing with God has nothing to do with your literal connection to Abraham. He recognizes that yes, you are the literal bloodline to Abraham. Yes, you can date your posterity all the way back to Isaac, to Jacob, and to Isaac, and to Abraham, and through Sarah. But he says that your standing with God had nothing to do with your literal connection. It had everything to do with being obedient to the principles of God. Notice what the Bible says in John chapter 8. 
Notice what Jesus says concerning the nation of Israel. Notice what he says. John chapter 8. Many today would read these very promises and still believe that these were just, you know, just stern counsel. Not as if God was really going to do these things, but, you know, he just said this just to threaten and, and cause them to live right. But he really wasn't going to do it, even though today the entire ethnic nation of Judaism rejects Jesus Christ. And somehow or another, the Christian community has, has, is still confused as to who is the people of God. Notice what it says in John 8, 31. John chapter 8 and verse 31. The Bible says, Then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on him, If, notice now, watch this, If you continue in my word, what? Then are you my what? Disciples indeed. He's go and then it says, and ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall do what? Shall make you free, he says. Now I want you to notice something. In this understanding of making you free, the Jews are going to go back, they're going to relate their freedoms to Abraham. Watch this. But Jesus just says, what makes you free? The truth makes you free. And then it says in verse 33, then they, then, excuse me, they answered him, we be one, Abraham's seed, and were never in bondage to any man. How sayest thou, ye shall do what? Ye shall be made free. Now notice, when they're referring to bondage, they are literally in bondage to the Romans at this very moment when, they, when they're speaking this. They're in bondage to the Romans. But Jesus was not referring to their literal physical subservient to the Roman, to the nation. Jesus was referring to their spiritual condition. They were, were making reference to Isaac and Abraham as being free, but really Christ was saying, because of your lifestyle, you were not Isaac's spiritual seed, but literally you were Ishmael. And we'll see this further. Notice what he says. They said, we're not, we were never in bondage. Verse 34, Jesus answered them, verily, verily, I say unto you, whosoever committeth sin is the servant of sin and the servant abideth not in the house forever but the son abideth ever if the son therefore shall make you free ye shall be free indeed i know he says that you are abraham's seed but ye seek to kill me because my word hath no place in you i speak that which i have seen of my father with my father and ye do that which ye have seen with what? Your father. They answered and said unto him, Abraham is our? Jesus said unto them, If ye were Abraham's children, ye would do the works of Abraham. He says, But now you seek to kill me as a man which have told you the truth, which I have heard of God. This did not Abraham. Verse 41. You do the deeds of what? Your father. Your father. And they say, and then said they to him, we be not born of what? Now, they're referring to Ishmael. They said, maybe he, maybe he fails to recognize that Abraham had two sons. Maybe he doesn't understand that there was a son born of fornication and that son born of fornication was Ishmael. But our father is Abraham. God is our father. So they were still saying that he's not understanding who we are. We're Abraham's seed, not Ishmael, but we're actually Isaac. But what does Jesus say in verse 44? It says, ye are of your father who? Now, Christ spoke of them as being not the f sons of Abraham or the children of God, but actually the children of who? The, the children of the devil. 
Now he said, what did he say? He says, you seek to do what? Kill me. He said, this Abraham didn't do. He's, Christ is literally linking them spiritually to Ishmael and not to Isaac. Watch what it says. Go on your Bibles to the book of Gal Galatians chapter 4. Let's go to Galatians chapter 4. Go with me to Galatians chapter 4. And then we're going to come back to Romans 9. Go to Galatians 4 first. Notice what Paul does here. Notice what Paul does in Galatians, the fourth chapter. Yes, Galatians chapter 4. And I want you to notice what it says, beginning in verse 28 down to 29. Notice what it says. Now, remember, he says, listen, if you continue on my word, then you're going to be free. They said we were never in bondage. We're all, we've always been free. They were in literal bondage to the Romans, but Christ was saying that they were in spiritual bondage because they were committing sin. They were in sin. They had violated the principles of God. Matthew 15, write it in your notes. They said to Jesus, why do you, your disciples transgress? Or why are you and your disciples sinning against the elders? Why are you out of harmony with the church? Because you do not keep the traditions of the elders. He says, well, I have a question for you. Why are your teachings, uh, why are your teachings transgressing the law of God? What he's saying is, if I follow your rules, I'll be sinning against God. But you are more concerned, not with the law of God, not being in harmony with God. You are more concerned with people being in harmony with the church. And Christ was showing them that their rules was placing them at variance with God, of who they thought that they were the children of God. But Christ was showing them that their actions had made them, their actions, by their actions, they were divorcing themselves from the Father. Watch this. Galatians chapter 4, verse 28 and verse 29. Notice what Paul says as he deals with this whole allegory of Ishmael and Isaac. And then he says, but as then... Verse 28, 20, pardon me. Now we, brethren, as Isaac was, are the children of what? Promise. Promise. Verse 29. But as then, he that was born after the what? Flesh, Flesh did what? Persecuted. Persecuted him that was born after the? Spirit. Even so it is Amen. now. So now, the fact that they were persecuting Christ, Christ was suggesting showing them that they were not actually the children of Isaac, but actually the children of children of Ishmael. Go back to Romans. Go to Romans chapter 9. Let's go to Romans, the ninth chapter. Are we still together? Amen. Romans chapter 9. Notice what the Bible says. Romans chapter 9, verse 6. Romans 9, 6 to verse 8. Watch this, brothers and sisters. Jesus was telling the children of Israel that they were wearing out the the they were wearing out their probationary time. God had given the children of Israel, the nation of Israel had given them a probationary period and they were wearing out and coming and about to divorce themselves from God by the persecution of God's people. And Jesus came, John the Baptist came, the disciples came and was trying to prevent and turn them back to God. He was trying to lead them to repent. Why? Because they had turned their backs on God. John the Baptist said, repent. Jesus said, repent. The disciples on the day of Pentecost said, repent. Come back, as it were, but they were hell-bent on going in a direction that was about to sever their connection from God. And like it says in the parable of Matthew 21, Jesus was about to take the vineyard from them and give it to another people. 
Watch what it says. You're in Romans chapter 9, verse 6 down to verse 8. Romans 9, chapter, Romans chapter 9, verse 6 to verse 8. The Bible says, not as though, not as though the word of God had taken of none effect. For they are not what? All Israel, which are of Israel, neither because they are the seed of Abraham are they all what? Children. But in Isaac, he said, shall thy seed be called. Hold your finger. We're not going to go there, but I want you to put down Galatians chapter 3, verse 24 to 26. Because it is there that Paul emphasizes, also write down verse 16 of Galatians 3. So Galatians 3, verse 16, then look at verse 24 down to verse 26. And then it tells us there in Galatians 3, 16, it says, In thy seed, not seed as of many, but seed as of one, and thy seed which is Christ. So Paul was showing the Galatians that, yes, the promise was given to Isaac, but Isaac was a representation or he typified Christ. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 1 that all the promises in Christ are yea and amen. So they understood as the disciples looking back under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, they saw that, yes, God made promises to Abraham. Yes, God made promises to Isaac. Yes, God made promises to Jacob. Yes, God made promises to our fathers. But those promises were of none effect without Christ. Those promises don't have no bearing on our lives if we reject Jesus. And for this reason, the disciples sought to implore the Jew, literal Jew, to find their place in Christ. He says, yes, these promises were made to our fathers. They were given to us. They were given to our fathers. But they're in Christ that they're made of effect, not just because we are Jews, not just because we are Christians. The promises are in Christ, yea, and amen. This is what he was trying to get across to them. Now, notice the point. We're finishing here in Romans 9. Look at verse 7 again. Neither, Paul says, neither because they are the what? seed of Abraham, are they all what? Children. But in Isaac shall thy seed be called. Your reference text is Galatians 3.16, verse 8. That is, they which are the children of the flesh, these are not the children of God, but the children of the promise are counted for the what? for the seed. So what he was saying is that those who are it, those who are Jews, but they were living in the flesh, he said, they're not the children of God. They're, they have no connection with God. They have connection with Abraham in the flesh, but they have no connection with God in the spirit. Notice what the Bible says. Let's go back to John. Let's go to John 15. The Gospel of John, chapter 15. Are we still together? Amen. John 15. Let's look at this, verses 1 to verse 5. John 15, verse 1 to verse 5. Watch this. John 15, verse 1 to verse 5. The Bible says, Christ speaking, I am the true vine, and my Father is the husbandman. Verse 2. Every branch in me that beareth fruit, beareth not fruit, he taketh away. And every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it that it may, that it may bring forth more fruit. Now ye are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. Abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself... Except it abide in the vine. No more can you, except ye abide in me. 
Verse 5, I am the vine, he says, and ye are the branches. Now, brothers and sisters, I want you to understand something. The children of Israel had always saw themselves as the branch. David talks about in Psalms 80 how God transplanted a vine out of Egypt. The Bible talks about in Psalms, uh, uh, not Psalms, pardon me, but in Isaiah 5, how God had planted a noble vine. But Christ now comes and he specifies and says, listen, you are not the vine, your branches. I am the vine. You are the branches. If you do not abide in me and are not bringing fruit, God says, Christ says, the Father is going to remove you. Notice what Paul says in Romans chapter 11. Romans chapter 11. Paul, illuminated by the Holy Spirit, understood this. Notice what it says in Romans chapter 11. And notice what the Bible says beginning in verse 22. Romans chapter 11, verse 22 to verse 24. Paul had a desire. He was, he was called to preach to the Gentiles, but Paul had a desire to see his brethren saved. He would to God that all Israel would be saved. Peter says, God is not willing for any to perish, but that all should come to repentance. They realized that God had given them a mission to the world. Their mission was not to convert the Jew specifically and only worry about the Jew. They did not, they recognized through the, through the illumination of the spirit that being a Jew afforded them nothing greater than the Gentile. Everything was in Christ. The same reality has come home to this our day. Our connection to a physical body of believers affords us no promises more than anyone else if we are disconnected from Christ. The name does not save the tree. The fruit does. Jesus says, if you abide in me and you bring forth fruit, Jesus will prune, will purge so that you continue to bear fruit. But if you have connected yourself, but yet the vine bears no fruit, guess what? It is clipped. It is removed from the vine. So the name does not save us. The name does not afford us any greater rights with God than anyone else that is not bearing fruit. We will be removed if we're not bringing forth the character of Christ. And so where the Jew fell is where Christianity is failing today because they believe that because of their profession of Christ, it gives them, it gives them access to the throne of God, but they don't recognize that their disconnection from Christ is what's causing them to be spewed out. It says in Romans 11, 22, Behold, therefore, the goodness and severity of God on them which what? Fail severity. On them which fail severity. But toward thee, goodness, what is it? What's that next word? If. if thou continue in his goodness, otherwise thou also shall be what? Wait a minute. Somebody got cut off, verse 23. And they also, if they abide not still in what? Unbelief, Unbelief shall be grafted in. For God is able also, for God is able to graft them in again. Verse 24. For thou, wert in, for thou wert cut out of the olive tree, which is wild by nature, and wert grafted contrary to nature into a good olive tree. 
how much more shall these, which be the natural branches, be grafted into their own olive tree? So who was he speaking about that was cut off? It was the Jew. Paul, illuminated through the Holy Spirit, recognized that the Jew was the nation of Israel, was rejected, was cut off by God. They were branches, dead branches, bringing not forth the fruit, and God broke them off. Peter, on the day of Pentecost, when the, when the 3,000 says, what, what shall we do? Men and brethren, he says, repent. Then he says, save yourself from this crooked generation. Save yourselves from these crooked individuals. He was talking about the Pharisees, the priests that had led them to reject and crucify the Son of God. And so the disciples now, those Jews who were there on the day of Pentecost, they said, what shall we do? He told them and he showed them Jesus. He magnified Christ. He showed that Christ was killed by their wicked hands. He showed how Christ was resurrected and not David, but Christ is now sitting on the right hand of the Father. And he says, these promises that God has left are for you and for your children. Why? Because now these promises are made effect in Christ. What shall we do to gain access to these promises? You must be willing to receive Jesus. And they accepted Christ, and now God began to add to his church. What church? The Jewish church? No. Because he told them in Matthew 23 that they were making proselytes, but they were becoming more the child of hell than themselves. But Jesus now had a body of believers that had embraced him as his, as their savior. And now God was strengthening them. Now notice, notice what our Bible says. Let's go to the book of first Peter. Let's, let's see what Peter has to say. Notice what it says. Let's go to 1 Peter chapter 2. 1 Peter chapter 2. Brothers and sisters, this is an example for us today. This is an example for those of us who believe that because of our profession and our connection that gives us access to the throne of God more than anyone else, while we are disconnected from Christ by his spirit. We are rejecting God's appeals and his warnings that he's sending us. And yet, because of our profession, because we can claim access to a certain group of people that we believe that we are the favorites of God and that God can do nothing without us. And Jesus is not coming back until we decide to get ourselves together. Brothers and sisters, we need not be deceived. God has left these things here for us that we would see that God is no respecter of persons, but every nation that worships him, everyone that calls upon him, God is revealing himself to them. Notice what it says. You're in first Peter chapter two, first Peter chapter two, and let's begin at verse 2. 1 Peter chapter 2, beginning at verse 2. Now, Peter is not talking here to the Jew. Peter is talking to new believers. Peter is talking to the strangers. Matter of fact, look at chapter 1, verse 1, so we can see who Peter is talking to. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 1 and verse 2. Watch this. The Bible says, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the what? Strangers. Strangers scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, uh, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. Verse 2, elect according to the what? For knowledge of God the Father. Hold up. If you're taking notes, put next to that Galatians chapter 3, verses 7 through 9, where Paul says that God foresaw that he would justify the heathen preached before the gospel 
unto Abraham. So now Peter is able to say that these individuals, these strangers that were far off, are, have been made nigh by the blood of Christ. He says, you were elect to the foreknowledge of God. God had opened a door for you when he called Abraham. Romans chapter 4, when Paul asked the question, Abraham, was he called or were these promises made to him when he was in circumcision or uncircumcision? He said not in circumcision, but in uncircumcision. So Abraham believed God and it was counted unto him for righteousness while he was yet uncircumcised. So when God called Abraham, it was a foreknowledging that God was going to call the entire world. It was the gospel being preached unto every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. But just like the Jews rejected Christ, so God raised up a, another people just as he raised up Abraham. So the Jew has no preeminence over anybody here Today, the only way the Jew has salvation, has access to the promises of God, is through Christ. But yet, the Christian community is still holding in high esteem Jerusalem. They're holding in high esteem Palestine because they do not understand the progression of truth. So God says, according to the foreknowledge, Peter says, jump back to chapter 2 of 1 Peter. Are we still together? Amen. 1 Peter chapter 2, beginning in verse 2. The Bible says this. As newborn babes, Peter says, desire, he's talking to the new believers now, desire, desire the sincere milk of the word that you may grow thereby. If so, watch this, if so be you have tasted that the Lord is gracious. Verse 4, to whom coming as unto a what? Living stone. As unto a living stone. Watch this. Disallowed indeed of men, but what? Chosen of God. But chosen of God. Ye also as lively stones are built up a spiritual house, holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. Wherefore also it is contained in the scripture. He says this, Behold, I lay in where? Zion, Zion a chief cornerstone, cornerstone elect, precious, and he that believeth on him shall not be confounded. Now wait a minute. The Bible says he, Paul Peter, is quoting from uh, Isaiah 28. He says in Zion, God is going to lay a stone. And out of Zion, again, God is going to build up this truth. God is going to build up this holy temple that David built in Zion. But wait a minute. Was God speaking about literal Mount Zion? No. He said, listen, he said, you are these stones. The same stones that were dug out of the quarry, those same stones that were fitted outside and brought in, and there was not heard within his temple a hammer. The stones were brought already fitted and put in place. He says, you are these stones now. You look at those literal stones. And all of a sudden, but you fail to recognize, he says, but you are these lively stones. Not these inanimate rocks that built up Mount Zion. He said, no, you are the lively stones and God is building now not a physical house, but a spiritual, spiritual house. The chief cornerstone, that chief cornerstone, according to the book of Ephesians, is Jesus. 
He is that chief cornerstone. And those who accept him, those who are hewn and squared by the word of God, those who allow their characters to be merged into the character of Christ, those who are dying to self, those who are putting away sin, those who are forsaking the world, those who are becoming one with Christ are being made into those corn, into those stones. And while it is unperceivable or perceptible, while the work is imperceptible to mankind, God is still squaring and hewing individuals for the building. And the, the sad thing is, is that when the building goes up, many people are going to be surprised because God did not do it in a way that they anticipated. When, the, when Mount Zion was built, there was not heard in the temple not one stone or hammer. The stones were prepared without the building. Away from the building. Away from the church. Away from the, the preaching that we think that we often have to be a part of in order to be prepared for God's temple. But when God brought those stones, they were already prepared. And so the building went up quietly, just like today, while individuals are believing and they're looking at this literal stone, while they're looking at this literal building, while they're looking at these literal denominations, they fail to recognize that God is building even right now a spiritual house. God is squaring people for the building and they're being saved without the church. They're having experiences without the church. Why? Because God is not trusting them to participate in church services because of how the ministers and the members would cause them to lose sight of Jesus. There are people who are longing, who are open for truth. They're longing for guidance. We are told that they are sitting, as it were, on the very edge of heaven, waiting to be gathered in. But God is not permitting them to meet in many of our congregations because we are so caught up with the most trifling things known to mankind. We would run these precious souls away from Jesus. They would be discouraged. And so God is saving them Without the church, he says in verse six again, wherefore also it is contained in the scripture. Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone. He's elect. He's precious. And he that believeth on him shall not be confounded. Verse seven. Unto you, therefore, which believe he is precious, but unto them which be disobedient. The stone which the builders disallowed, the same is made the what? Head of the corner. A stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. Even to them would stumble at the word. Being what? Disobedient. Disobedient. Wherefore also they were appointed. You can write next to that, write down Acts chapter 4 verses 8 to 12. Peter talks as he talks to the Sanhedrin, and he lets them know that that which they rejected, the Father has raised up. That which they have turned their backs on, that which they have, they have, they have wrote out of their policies, that which they have legislated away from their pulpits. God has made the head of the corner, and though truth may not be allowed in your conference, though truth may not be allowed in your pulpit, God is still preaching and preparing souls to occupy places that those who were appointed to his glory are being rejected. God is still saving even though individuals are turning their backs on God. Now notice, brothers and sisters, we said Peter and the disciples understood that Jesus, in hindsight now, because while the disciples walked with Christ, they, 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 they were still believing that God was going to restore the temple. 
They were looking for this restoration of the temple. But brothers and sisters, Peter, before he died, Peter understood that Jerusalem was not the place that God favored. He realized that it was not the building. He realized that it was not these individuals who had rejected him. He realized that these precious souls who were accepting the truth, he said, you are the church of God. Notice, he goes on and says, notice what he says in verse 9. Notice, but ye are, watch this, but ye are a what? Chosen generation. Chosen generation. A royal priesthood, a what? Holy, Holy nation, a what? Peculiar people. Now, wait a minute, brothers and sisters. Remember, remember that we studied the other night when we talked about the Old and the New Covenant, and we went to Exodus 19. Exodus 19 says, God says, listen. My covenant, I am going to make you all of these things. And he listed all of these things right here. In Exodus 19, he listed, oh, you'll be a peculiar people. You'll be a holy nation. And he began to list these things. And remember, they said, all that the Lord has said, we will do, we'll obey. But we find right here, Paul, Peter says they were disobedient. So now he's looking to the stranger. And he says, listen, what they failed to become in Christ, because they didn't understand that it was through Christ. They understand, they thought that it was through their own acceptance. They thought it was through their own profession of faith. They thought it was through their own affiliation and their own position in the church and their own intellectual knowledge and their own assent to theological tenets of the gospel. They felt that through themselves, they were a peculiar people because they worshiped on a particular day, because they had a particular diet, because they believed in a particular prophet. And they thought that through themselves that they could be a peculiar people, but they are disobedient. They are rejecting the very truths that God is sending them. And Peter says they have stumbled and what they have rejected has become the head and the corner of what God is establishing through you new believers. Amen. Through your desire to walk in the truth, you now. And so it's almost as though he's given them an admonition, but he's also cautioning them that they do not stumble by rejecting the truth. He says, desire that sincere milk of the word that you may grow thereby. You are those living temples. When you read in the Old Testament, the book of Isaiah, and Isaiah is talking about Mount Zion. He's not talking about that building over there on that hill. He's talking about you. This is what Peter says. Peter says he's talking about you. You were elect to the foreknowledge of God. God dwelleth not in temples made with hands. Yes, we want to say that God doesn't dwell in the Vatican. Yes, we want to say that God doesn't dwell in these mega churches. Yes, we want to say that, that God is not into all of this foolishness, but we fail to recognize that we are doing the same thing they are doing. So God does not dwell in their temples. And brothers and sisters, God is not dwelling in many of our temples either. God is not into these buildings. God says, know ye not, Paul says, that you are the temple of God? That you are the place where the Holy Spirit wants to abide, not in this building? And this is what they understood. And so he says, when you hear Mount Zion, don't think of a building. You don't need to travel to Palestine. You don't need to look to there for God to do something. You must understand that God is trying to work in you by his spirit. And he goes on. He says in verse 9 again, but ye are the chosen generation. But wait a minute. I thought the Jews were. Peter tells these strangers, no, you are the chosen generation. You are. Are the royal priesthood. Wait a minute, I thought Aaron was. No, you are. You're the priesthood. What about the holy nation? I thought Israel was the holy nation. No, I'm talking to you strangers. I'm talking to you new believers that are coming in. You are the holy nation. You must be a peculiar people. But watch this, that ye should show forth the praises of him who hath what? called you out of darkness into his what? Marvelous light. Wait a minute. Ch 
church, the true definition of church is the called out ones. So when Peter says, you have been called out of darkness, he says, you are the church. You have accepted the truth of God. You have embraced Christ as your personal savior. You consist of God's church, although you may never ever be counted or written on earthly books in a physical church. But have you embraced the truth? Have you been born again by his spirit? Then you are a part of God's church, he says. Verse 10, which in times past were what? You were not a people, but are now what? The people of God. Which have not, which had not obtained mercy, but now he says what? But now you have obtained mercy. So he says again, where does that take us back to? Take us back to Hosea and Gomer and her children. Yes, you were once considered uh, a, a people that were without mercy. Why? Because of the way you lived. But now that you have embraced the truth, you have obtained mercy. Peter was trying to emphatically let these individuals know that though the literal Jew will never accept you, but because you've accepted Jesus, you are a chosen generation. And so today, there will be people that will never accept you. You're not a part of our conference. You don't send your, you don't send your money to us. You don't abide by our rules. You're not a part of God's church. You must understand that because you have embraced truth, that because you are willing to walk in the spirit, you are a chosen generation. Now, brothers and sisters, I want us to look at a few more points before we close this. Notice what the Bible says. Uh, let's go in our Bibles to the book of Matthew chapter... 22. I think we want to go there. Let's go to Matthew chapter 22. Matter of fact, stop by Matthew 21 before we get to 22. I want you to notice what it says in Matthew 21. Jesus gives a parable of his vineyard. And in this particular parable, he shows how the Jew, the literal Jew, was rejecting time after time. God sent them warning after warning. God was calling for fruits to be brought forth. But like we read in John 15, they were not bringing forth fruits. Therefore, they were to be cast out. And God sent them warning after warning concerning the nearness of the end. God had tried through Isaiah, through Jeremiah. <clears throat> Isaiah, as he preached, Isaiah looked at this generation and said, who hath believed our report? To whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? He looked and he saw, as it were, that no one, it appears as though there was no great response to the preaching of Isaiah. There were, the nation was not, as it were, coming back, being drawn back to God. And it got to a point where Isaiah, almost in his frustration, said, Who have believed our report? To whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? But then his eye was turned to Jesus. And he saw that Jesus was going to see the travail of his soul and be satisfied. Isaiah was becoming discouraged because he did not see his people responding to the gospel. But he saw Jesus and he saw that Jesus would not be discouraged. And he again took up strength and began to preach. And he saw that Jesus would see the results or Isaiah would see that in Christ all would be fulfilled and generation after generation prophet after prophet was raised up to preach to bring the literal Jew back to an understanding to understand who God was and their mission to the world but they failed and they continue to fail and now Jesus is giving this parable concerning the end of their fate concerning that they were soon to be rejected as a nation. He says, as he reads through this particular 
as he goes through this, and you can start in verse 33, but I want us to look in verse 40. Well, I'll start in verse 33, just to give you an understanding. We're not going to read all of it, but it says, Hear another parable. Jesus is constantly bringing these things home to their hearts. Before this, he talked about the parable of the two sons. And he says, hey, well, which son did the will of his father? One said he was going to go, and the other one didn't. One said he was going to go, and the other one said he wouldn't go. The one who said he would actually did not go after all. But the one who said he wasn't going repented, and he went. Which of the two did the will of his father? And they said, well, obviously, it was the, sec it was the one that repented. And he says, likewise, John the Baptist came preaching. And he says, the publicans and the harlots, they heard him and they repented and they returned. While you church members, while you elders and deacons and Sabbath school teachers and, and, and preachers and evangelists, you heard the message and conference leaders, you said you were going, you made a pretext of being in the church, but in reality, you haven't gone either. But praise God, they repented and they are now in the vineyard. Because notice, brothers and sisters, the call to the two sons was not to occupy the building, but it was to occupy the vineyard. Let me say that again. The two sons were sent by God to occupy the vineyard and not the building. Who will go to work today in my field? Yes, the table is full, but the vineyard is empty. And he sent these two sons. One said, Father, I'll gladly go. And he did not go. There was one said, I, I have nothing to do with the vineyard. But he repented. And he eventually went. Who did the will of his father? The one that repented. How did he repent? By the preaching of John. John called for repentance, conversion. John came with stern rebukes. And when they heard that message, when they saw their true condition, when they realized they were sinners and they realized that they were lost and without hope and without God, they repented and they went into the vineyard. While those rejected the preaching of John, Christ went on in this parable of Matthew 21, 33. Here another parable he says, there was a certain householder which planted a vineyard. He hedged it round about, digged a wine press in it, and built a tower, and lent and let it out to husbandmen, and went into a far country. And when the time of the fruit drew near, he sent his servants to the husbandmen, that they might receive the fruits of it. And the husbandmen took his servants. They beat one, killed another, stoned another. Again, he sent other servants, more than the first. And they did unto them likewise. But last of all, he sent unto them his son, saying, They will what? Reverence my son. But when the husbandmen saw the son, they said among themselves, This is the heir. Come, let us kill him. Let us seize upon his inheritance. They caught him and they did what? Cast him out of the vineyard and did what? And slew him. Right down next to that, I want you to put Hebrews 13, where Jesus suffered without the gate. Jesus was suffered without the precincts of Jerusalem. They took him away from the temple, and it was away from the temple that he hung up on the cross. So I want to ask you a question. When Jesus says, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto myself. Was Jesus in the temple or was he out in the vineyard? In the vineyard. So therefore, brothers and sisters, Jesus is drawing people out of the church. That's another one later on. Jesus is drawing people to himself. Jesus is on the outside of the gate. He's on the outside of their vineyard. Jesus is out there. And Paul says, let us go without the gates bearing his reproach. We must go to him. 
Christ is calling people to himself, and but he's in a position, he has placed himself in a position where, where, where his influence will not be hindered by the policies of the church, where they will not be, where his message will not be muddled down by the church and its policies. He preferred to be hung on the outside of the temple. So that nothing could in in nothing could interfere with souls being drawn to him. Because had he died in the temple, brothers and sisters, then the thief would not have got to his side. Had he been in the church, then those who needed him the most would not have found him. Because the ministers, the policy writers, the lawyers would have made rules to keep people away from the cross. But he was sacrificed on the outside where anyone who wanted him could find him. And this is where God is calling us. And the Bible says they, they, uh, uh, they seized him, cast him out, they slew him. Verse 40, when the Lord therefore of the vineyard cometh, what will he do unto those husbandmen? And they said unto him, he will what? Miserably destroy those wicked men and will let out his vineyard unto what? Husband. Other husbandmen, which shall render him the fruits in his season. Jesus said unto them, did ye never read in the scriptures? The stone which the what? Build is rejected. The same has become the head of the corner. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in your eyes. Therefore, I send to you the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God shall be taken from you and given to a nation, bringing forth the fruits thereof. And whosoever shall fall on this stone shall be broken. But on whomsoever it shall fall, it shall grind in the power. Verse 45, watch this. And when the chief priests and the Pharisees heard this Parable, his parables, they what? Perceived. They perceived that he spake of them. They realized that they were the unfaithful son. They realized that they were the children and that they presently were the murderers of those who had called for them to give an account of their stewardship. They realized that they were the ones writing the policies that were shedding truth out of the churches. They were convicted at that moment that God was going to take it away from them. They were upset. But I want you to notice. Let's look at a couple of more passages before we close. Matthew 22. Jesus just continues to allow them and us to understand not only the fate of the Jew, but God also is trying to warn us the fate of this last generation. Notice what it says in Matthew 22. And Jesus spake another parable. Verse 2. The kingdom of heaven is like unto a certain king which made a marriage for his son. He sent forth his servants to call them that were bidden to the wedding, and they would not. And he sent forth other servants, saying, Tell them which are bidden, Behold, I have prepared my dinner, my oxen, my fatlings are killed, and all things are ready. Come unto the marriage. But they made light of it, and they went their ways, one to his farm, the other to his merchandise. And the remnant took his servants, and what? Treated them spitefully, and what? And slew them. Now, again, this is connected with the parable we just read before. There were messages, messengers that were sent, and rather than them responding, they made light of what was being preached and being told to them, and they got sick of hearing it, and then they eventually did what? They eventually killed them. They made light of it. But as a result of killing these messengers, notice what happened. Verse 7, but when the king heard thereof, he was wroth. wroth and sent forth his armies and did what? Destroyed and destroyed them. those murderers and burned up their what? City. And burnt up their city. Jesus, in this particular parable, tells them the fate of rejecting 
truth is now you must contend with these nations as a result of the Jews rejecting the, the, the cry to come to the marriage feast, as a result of rejecting Jesus, God says the king is going to send forth his armies and do what? Burn up their city. Brothers and sisters, what happens is when we as individuals reject God's truth, when we as a church reject God's truth, we have no protection from the nations round about us. What we are seeing in society today, the, the, the overreaching of the state, bending the arm of the church, is due to the church rejecting the call to repent. We're trying to get the world to repent. We're traveling everywhere. We're trying to get homosexuals and we're trying to get atheists and we're, 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 we're trying to get all these people to repent. But the repentance need to happen with the church. The church has rejected the truth of God. And so now the church, uh, Franklin Graham and, and Jeffries and, and all these evangelicals are, are despising the state. They're, de they're despising Democrats and they're, they're despising Planned Parenthood and they're, they're despising the LBGTQ and they're, they're despising Black Lives Matter and they're, they're despising all of these women feminist movements and they're despising all of these things and they believe that these things are interfering with the church and is causing them to lose their ability but the reality of it is the reason why these things are destroying the church is because the church has rejected Jesus. The church has rejected Christ. Now, brothers and sisters, right here, this prophecy points to the destruction of Jerusalem. I want to look at this as we close. Go to Matthew 24. Matthew chapter 24. Jesus told them in Matthew 24, beginning in verse 1. Matthew 24 beginning in verse matter of fact look at matthew 23 37 matthew 23 37 want to look at a few texts and we're closing matthew 23 37 notice what the bible says matthew 23 37 it says this oh jerusalem oh what jerusalem jerusalem, jerusalem thou that what the and stone is them which are sent unto thee remember in the parables what were they doing stoning them killing them who was it it was jerusalem it was the priests the pharisees they were the ones who were sending the police as it were to arrest jesus john chapter 7 they sent the police go and get him he's mad go and take him police came back jesus wasn't with them why haven't you brought him? They said, never man speak like this man. Are you also deceived? Has anyone in the church believed on him? Have any of these conference ministers accepted his teachings? Has any of our institutions started endorsing their teachings? Do you find this type of teachings in our seminaries? Are you deceived like these common people? They don't have degrees like us. They're not scholars. They don't understand homiletics. They don't understand how to, how to, how to exegesis a, a, a chapter. They don't understand these things. They're foolish because they haven't gone to our schools. Have any of, has the denomination embraced them? Are they a part of our committees and organizations? They're deceived. And Jesus says, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets and stonest them which are sent unto thee. How often, watch this, how often would I have gathered thy children together, even as a hen gathereth her chickens under her wings? And ye would not, verse 38, behold what? Your house, Your house is left unto you desolate. Jesus looked at Jerusalem and he says, this house in John chapter 2, he said it was the Father's house. Matthew 21, he said it was the Father's house. Quoting from Isaiah 56, it was the Father's house. John 2, Father's house. Matthew 21, Father's house. But here he says, guess what? It is it's your house. You can have the church. 
You can have this building. You can do whatever you want with it. It's yours. Wait a minute. This is, this is supposed to be holy land. This is, this is the glorious land. God says you can have it. It could be glory to you. It's yours. Keep it. It's your glory land. You can have it. Do whatever you want with it. Jesus left. Verse chapter 24, verse 1. And Jesus went out, departed from the temple, and the disciples came unto him. They didn't understand and show him the building of the temple. In other words, they said, Jesus, I, I, I heard you say something that the house was left desolate, but, but Lord, look at this. And I could imagine in their minds, they're thinking of all the promises of the Old Testament. How are you going to say it's desolate? Are you contradicting Jeremiah? Are you contradicting uh, Isaiah? Are you contradicting uh, 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 Moses? Are you contradicting all of these prophets? Jesus goes on and says in verse 2, Jesus said unto them, See ye not all these things? Verily I say unto you, There shall not be left one stone upon another, that, not, that shall not be what? All right, stay in the same chapter, jump over. Notice what it says in verse 15. He elaborates on this. When ye shall see, when ye therefore shall see the what? Abomination. The abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet. Stand in the holy place, or like Mark says, standing where it should not be. When you start seeing this abomination standing where it ought not to be, then guess what? The desolation is coming you just said this house is left desolate in Matthew 23, 37. He says, when you shall see the abomination that is going to desolate this house, know that the time is near. Go to Luke chapter 21. Luke chapter 21. What is this you're talking about, Jesus? Remember, you rejected Christ. Therefore, the city, God is going to allow these kings, these earthly kings to come and do what? Burn up their city. Is that what we read? Yes. Notice what it says in Luke 21, verse 20 now. Jesus takes up this same story. And when ye shall see what? Jerusalem. Jerusalem compassed with what? Armies. Armies. Then know that the what? Thereof is... All right. He said, now notice, yes, your house is left unto you. In other words, this house that you put so much pride in is going to be destroyed. This denomination that you put so much pride in is going to be taken from you. The kings are going to strip you of your power. You're going to have to worship. You're going to have to do what these earthly kings say. You're not going to be able to preach where you want to. You're not going to be able to hold worship services where you want to. Why? Because you rejected his truth. He tells Jerusalem, your house is going, this house is going to be destroyed. Disciples come to him saying, when? He says, when you see the abomination, when you see the world influencing the church, when they should not be, he said, just know that the desolation is what? Just know that the desolation is nigh. Brothers and sisters, I want to tell you, the desolation is nigh. The desolation is nigh. We feared the last administration because of all the rights that they gave to the LBGTQ. All of the rights that they gave to all these various organizations. And they seemed to marginalize the church. But oh, brothers and sisters, this administration has now said, no, I'm not going to give all these other powers. Uh, I'm not going to give all these other entities. I am now going to remove the restriction that, 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 that now, once I tear down this last barrier, the desolation can be complete. Oh, brothers and sisters, we have a lot to fear today. Verse 20 again, it says, And when ye shall see Jerusalem compassed with armies, then know that the what? Desolation thereof is not. 70 AD, Jerusalem was pillaged by Rome. They rejected Jesus. They rejected the call of the prophets. 
And before Christ died, he says, your house is left unto you desolate. God took the kingdom from them. God, the gospel, the message of the hour, God took it from them and he put it into the heart of those who were rendering the fruit in their season. Those who were responding to the call, God had given them the message. So can you imagine on the day of Pentecost when Caiaphas and Ananias and all the Sanhedrin, the Sadducees, the Pharisees, the scholars, the theologians, the liberals, the conservatives, while they stood there and as they listened to these men preach with power, I'm sure they probably wondered and their minds went back when they first entered into the schools of the seminaries. They had a desire to preach, but their minds were watered down by all of this false theology and they lost the spirit of God. They lost the connection with heaven and they thought that their success and ministry would be due to their conforming to the ideas of the people around them. And they started preaching heresy when they knew it was. And all of a sudden here, God gives these men the power of the Holy Spirit because they are converted to Christ. And God pours into their minds truth and they're proclaiming truth and thousands are responding and the Jews are becoming more infuriated because they are recognizing that God has truly given the kingdom to another people. Strangers, Peter says, all over the place. God was calling people not into the Jewish church or to the denomination of Judaism, but God was calling people unto himself. He was building up that spiritual house. But brothers and sisters, today, those those Christians who were first called Christians in Antioch, that name that God had given them, today the name Christian has no more power than the name Jew did in the days of Jesus. And what God had done or had, what God did to the Jewish nation for rejecting his truth, so God is doing today to this so-called Christian community. It is being rejected by God. Are you saying that Christians are, are, are out of favor and harmony with God? Yes. But those who partake of his truth, those who are leaving darkness and entering into that marvelous light that shines in the face of Jesus Christ, Jesus says to them today, you are my house. You are a, 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 you are, are, are an asylum for my Holy Spirit. You are the vine, the branch by which my character can be demonstrated to the world. You are a holy nation. You are the ones that God is calling. And so today we look at the Christian community. We look at their cathedrals and their, their beautiful big, massive followings, and we look at their big mega churches, but their gospel, but the message they're preaching is meager and is not affecting souls. And just like the Jews rejected the truth of God because it placed them in an inconvenient position, so the churches today have turned their back on the truth. While they're denouncing homosexuality and their pastors are practicing it. They're denouncing sins that they themselves are guilty of. God is not in these dwellings. Jesus, as it were in the days of the Jews, is without the temple. And it is without the temple that Jesus is being lifted up. And it seems as though, brothers and sisters, that God is drawing people to himself rather than to these churches. And brothers and sisters, God is trying to draw us to himself. And many of us are torn between our place in the church in Jesus. We believe that we can that we can somewhat merge both of them together. Yes, I, I, I want I esteem my place as an elder. So I know that God has given this truth, but I'm going to find a way to somehow or another uh, uh, melt down the truth 
uh, low enough to where I could somewhat merge it and keep Christ and also keep my position as Sabbath school teacher. Keep my position as an elder. Keep my position as a pastor, associate pastor, because I like the, I like the check. And therefore, I, I can't do not too hasty. Surely Jesus wouldn't want me to preach truth that would offend and I lose my job. How will I affect the people of God? Paul says, go without the gate. Bear his reproach. Jesus suffered without the gate. But we don't want to go out there. Because should we go out there, then we might lose the esteem of our family members. We won't get invited to the family vacations. We won't get invited to the Christmas dinners. We won't get invited to Thanksgiving. We won't get invited to, to, to certain things at the church if we should start doing what we see Jesus doing and did while he was upon the earth, what the disciples did. So brothers and sisters, we see that God has pulled, he's rejected the Jewish nation. Can the Jew be saved? In Christ he can. In Christ he was, he was broken off, but can he be saved? In Christ, Paul says in Galatians 3, he says, those who are of Christ are the children of Abraham. So how can the Jew be saved today? In Jesus. God is not concerned with the Dome of the Rock. God is not concerned with, with, with giving any land back to Israel. That's man's idea. That's, that's, that's Satan's deception for his masterful deception. God is concerned with giving people Heaven. That's where Christ said, I've gone to prepare a place for you. And we're, we're unconcerned about that place, but we're more concerned about what's happening in Palestine. And brothers and sisters, many are setting themselves up to be deceived. And the question is for us tonight, where do we stand? What happened to them is an example. What happened to them is, is, is a warning for us. But where do we stand today? Are we more in love with our positions than we are with the truth of God? Are we like that son who said, Lord, I'm going, but we're not? Are we, are, have we seen, yes, God has given me this position, but are we using the position to smite our brethren? Are we using the position to smite those who are turning people from darkness to light? If we are, then God is preparing to tell us, your house is left unto you desolate. God is preparing, I'm going to spew you out. But if we receive Christ, if we come in harmony with his truth, if we repent, then brothers and sisters, God will send us in this vineyard. Father in heaven. Father in heaven.